now it's for posterity and I'm going to admit uh, the 65 people who are in the waiting room. So hold on. Yeah. All right, so far we have uh, 75 people in. Welcome everybody, please bear with us as we're admitting everybody. Give us a minute. Hi everybody. <laughs> There's father. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay. okay. Oh, I thought of Tom is not coming. Okay. I just want everybody to know that we are recording this uh, webinar and we'll put it up as soon as it uh, is available tomorrow for anybody who wants to share it or have it. Okay. A little bit like popcorn, so it has slowed down in the percolation. So um, we're going to give it just like one more minute okay. until uh, six oh five, and then we'll get going. Feel like I'm back in the classroom. I know, right? Have a few more jumping in last minute. Father Gill, I think you can take it away. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Father Gil Martinez, and I'm the uh, pastor of the Paul's Church here at St. Paul's uh, the Apostle here in Westwood. Uh, welcome to those joining us from our parish and from around the country, especially friends from uh, New York and other parts of the Paul's universe. Uh, welcome to the special and timely program, I hope. It's a, a Father Sarah and his legacy. The backdrop, of course, is today's reckoning with our national awareness of racism yesterday and today and, and the removal of statues of historical figures. Uh, for example, Confederate generals throughout the South and removal of the Confederate flag from public spaces and even from one state flag. It, it, for throughout the state of California, statues of Sarah, uh, the founder of the California mission system, uh, have been forcibly taken down, defaced, or removed by local jurisdictions. Uh, Sarah was a Franciscan priest uh, from Spain who deeply desired to preach the gospel to Native people who had not heard it before. In fact, when he encountered Natives who had heard the gospel, he he kind of lost some of his zeal. So that passion for his evangelization was a priority of his life as a missionary. And his, and his missionaries were central to the Spanish colonization of California in the late 18th century. Uh, but he was a man of his time. I think that's a phrase we've been hearing a lot uh, 
a lot over the past uh, a few months uh, since the terrible events in Minnesota. In California, nearly all mission cities, major cities have been built around the missions. Uh, if you're not from here, it, it's, it's San Diego, San Francisco, Los Angeles, <laughs> it, 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 it revolves around that. So it's in this reassessment of the colonial encounter between Father Sarah and his brother Franciscans and the native peoples of California, where we find the conflict over the honoring of Father Sarah in statues of public spaces. For most Catholics, Father Sarah, Father Sarah is a canonized saint. Well, for all Catholics, but some don't recognize him that way. Uh, for others, he is accused of participating in everything from kind of a benign racist colonial paternalism to genocide. So what we've done is we've invited uh, Professor Ruben Mendoza of the California State University of Monterey Bay to talk about Father Sarah and the reinterpretation of his legacy today. Uh, tonight's format will begins with uh, Dr. Mendoza's present presentation until about 6.55, at which time we will open the chat section for questions that you may have, and we'll conclude at uh, 7.30. The event has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube site, St. Paul the Apostle Media, uh, beginning tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Ruben Mendoza is an archeologist, writer, photographer, and founding faculty member and chair of the School of Social Behavioral and Global Studies at CSU Monterey Bay. He has uh, conducted archeological and ethno-historical investigations in the California missions and American Indian sites, uh, Colorado, the Southwest, and Mesoamerica. Uh, he, dis he discovered the uh, Sarah Chapel in 1772 in Monterey and advanced that studies in the life and times of, of, the, of the Santa Junipero Serra. Uh, he has nearly 200 published articles, chapters, reviews, and books, and many, many others, including uh, California Missions, Mission San Miguel Arcángel, and the forthcoming the Spanish style house from Enchanted Andalusia to the California Dream. In 2015, he served as an expert for the uh, Serra Symposium convened at the Augustinium in Rome and participated in the Pontifical Mass honoring Blessed Serra, celebrated by Pope Francis. Then he was sub subsequently invited by the Archdiocese to attend the canonization of Father Serra, convened at uh, the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception in DC and presided over by Pope Francis. He continues to write and publish on the art, architecture, and material culture of early California and the pre-Columbian world. And he's a good friend of my sister, Lily, who works at CSUMB. Hi, Lily. I hope you're out there. Hello, Lily. You're a, <laughs> a good friend of me, too. Um, so um, welcome, Ruben, and thank you for joining us this night. We're really excited to, to, to uh, engage in this conversation. Well, thank you, Father Gill. I'm, I'm most honored to have been invited. I realize that these are momentous times with major issues related uh, to an, a, a growing social consciousness about the history of this country and more uh, specifically about colonialism and the globalization of the world in which we live. Uh, we are all part of that and we can't divorce ourselves from that. And so I have had to grapple with this, uh, this very thing since I was a young man. As a, a, a young Mexican American kid growing up in the Central Valley uh, where I was accustomed to you know, being taunted by Klan, uh, being dealt with in racist ways dealing with a lot of the kinds of structural inequalities, in fact, the poverty that my family suffered and the racism that my family endured uh, is something that is very close to my heart and something that I have fought to deal with, but by way of education. For me, it was a way to go from uh, swords to plowshares. And uh, our campus, in fact, had that as a motto, that we would build a campus devoted to multiculturalism and diversity and the inclusion of any and all peoples from California who merited coming into an institution like ours and being received in a way unlike the way I'd often been received in other universities where I was a student. So uh, let's just say that you know, I applaud the efforts of many of those justice seekers that are out there today who are risking their lives on the front lines. Uh, and also uh, looking at it from both ends of the spectrum, we also have those who are attempting to keep the peace. So I don't tend to judge these people because they are living within a specific historical moment that is truly momentous uh, and transformative. But that's not my beef here. Mine has been that as a young man growing up in, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, I was born in French Camp, California, and I grew up in Fresno, California, uh, of, of all things on a chicken ranch. Uh, and uh, there wasn't much out there that I could identify with we lived in the projects, we lived in, you know, in the barrio. And in so doing, I began to realize that there was a paucity of identity. Uh, everything that I was introduced to, 
uh, had no mention, no articulation of the role of my ancestors. I really didn't know who they were. And so whenever I went into a textbook or I sat in a class all the way through middle school, the minute the Alamo came up as an issue, I always felt put upon because I was often the only Latino kid in the classroom. And that emboldened me to want to learn who my ancestors were. And so as a result of a trip to Mexico City to visit my abuelita, my grandmother, who's Yaqui Indian, and my grandfather, who is essentially an early uh, uh, criollo, if you will, a uh, Spaniard who lived in Mexico through the colonial period, uh, this unlikely duo married. And while they never got along, they stuck it out all the way to the end. And she was there for him on his deathbed. Even though she had some very choice words for him, they realized that their mutual survival depended inherently on their ability to be there for one another. That, in effect, is part of what I've had to grapple with. Um, you know, Octavio Paz and others have talked about the Malinche complex. And the Malinche complex is something that uh, many of us, in, uh, whether in Mexico or in Latin America or in the US as Mexican Americans, we have to contend with this because we are mestizo. We are both indigenous and we are European by origin. And while there are many of us in our communities that reject the European or reject the indigenous, I have chosen to embrace both of these. Uh, I do not take sides where my ancestors are concerned. I construe myself indigenous, American Indian. Uh, and I have plenty of track record to go along with that not to mention many publications that address that. What I wanna do here is to look at and try to understand with you uh, the nature of Frey Junipero Serra's legacy uh, in what is today Mexico, then the Viceroyalty of New Spain, so that we can kind of walk through the steps that this individual took uh, to arrive in California, uh, establish the initial uh, sites of the mission enterprise, and then through the course of generations since his death, be both upheld as a symbol of white supremacy and condemned for that very thing. And in fact, Sarah had no allusions to that effect. He saw himself as essentially uh, indigenous to the communities that he served. He was their servant. Uh, and in fact, given that he spent the second 35 years of his total 70 years of life, uh, before his death in 1784, I construe him as Mexicano. And of course, some of you will hear that and say, that is not who he was, he was a Spaniard. But therein lies the roots of the Malinche complex. The idea that somehow you can take someone like me or one of those young uh, Mexican American children in a fourth grade classroom and bifurcate them and decide you're a Mexican Indian or you're a Spaniard, but you cannot be both. Uh, I beg to differ with that because the reality is we are a, a part of, a, of a, a warrior tradition, both from the Iberian Peninsula as well as the Americas. And for me, again, I don't take sides where the ancestors are concerned. I will tell you though, before I get going into the, the uh, slide presentation, that the reality is, is that when I was a very young man, my father grew to reject uh, Catholicism. Uh, and I didn't understand this because I had been baptized a Catholic. I'd gone to my first communion and then it all stopped. And my father went through kind of a spiritual journey where he, you know, he basically became a, a, a Mason. Uh, he was recruited to the Mormon faith. He became a Baptist and then he got lost in, in, in all of that. Uh, he, he never came back to the Catholic church and he began to revile it, but he couldn't pin down what it was he didn't like about it. And I've seen this before. Uh, the reality is, is that when I was a young man and when we traveled to Mexico City when I was age 12, um, I, I remember my father pulling over at an abandoned mission in the deserts of Northern Mexico. And bear in mind, there were over 100,000 of these built in a period of 150 years. Uh, and uh, this one was in ruins. The tombs had been desecrated. The building had been uh, defaced uh, as so many ancient buildings often are. And, uh, he told me there, he said, this is the cancer that the Europeans brought to the Americas. And from that point on, I, I, I struggled with the fact that I had a grandfather who was a, of European extraction. He had, they'd been there since the 1500s in Mexico, but he was still somehow a criollo. 
and my grandmother, a Yaqui Indian. And I began to identify with the Aztec civilization. I became what I often identify in our youth today as Neo-Mexica. That doesn't mean Neo-Nazi. Some people think that that's what I'm saying. It means these are the new Aztecs. I too was proud of that civilization. And I have published uh, numbers of articles, a couple of books that deal with the Aztecs. Uh, but when I was growing up, I was growing up in Bakersfield, California, and I saw a, a great deal of violence at my campus. I was beaten and I was forced to defend myself and my family members repeatedly. Uh, it's a wonder that I survived. And it, through all of that, I began to I, I, I began to negate and deny the existence of the violence, both in my world and in the world of the Aztec. I could identify with the Aztecs because they became my heroes. Everything about them was beautiful, their poetry, their writings, uh, the flowers, the, the monuments. And yet the monuments depicted individuals that were dismembered and decapitated like Cuatlique or Coyolchalqui. Uh, and, and yet I didn't see that. I didn't see the violence. Because for me, I had been indoctrinated in the violence, and I had to find a way to wean myself off of that. And in the final analysis, what I found was, uh, it wasn't until I was married and I had children that for the first time in my life, I actually saw the violence of the Mexica Aztec Empire. And then I began to understand the dynamics between how it was that their civilization was brought to its knees by a, a, a group of Spaniards uh, backed by a militia, a Native American militia of so close to 300,000 Native allies who happened to be enemies of the Aztec. And it was only then that I began to start to weigh those dimensions. But as I was beginning to weigh those dimensions, I was invited to work in a California mission at San Juan Bautista. Uh, I was invited because they needed an archeologist. I am an archeologist. And I began working there, but when I was first invited by the pastor, uh, I was suspicious. I thought, you know what, uh, I'm still on this thing about this being part of the cancer brought to the Americas by the Europeans. And then I, the next thought in my head was, no, this is uh, literally, this is literally uh, a concentration camp. And I thought, you know what, I've devoted my entire life to studying and interrogating American Indian civilization for the purposes of conveying the greatness of those civilizations to the young children that are looking at us as models for what they should be. I, I felt that I had an obligation. I still feel that. And that's why I'm not a bandwagon type of individual when it comes to taking sides with one side or another. And so as a result, uh, the work that I started at the mission, uh, I, I thought about it, I thought, I am a scientist. I need to take pause here. I need to consider this objectively. What does this mean? And for a moment, I thought, well, you know, I can't truly understand what was going on at this concentration camp unless I can see it from the other side. I took on the project, began uh, engaging in archaeological and ethno-historical research, began interrogating documents, and soon began to realize that a lot of what was being said by those that came to the missions, including fourth grade school teachers, was in error. For example, after some excavations at the site, I'd done, we made a number of discoveries. Uh, there happened to be these three pits, rectangular pits. Uh, they looked very menacing. There were charred marks all over them. There were chains. Uh, there were metal uh, braces. And, and anyway, one day as I was walking through, there was an Anglo school teacher talking to a group of young Chicanitos, young Mexican-American children. And I happened to hear through the corner of my, uh, you know, through, through uh, in passing, that she told the children, this is where your ancestors tortured the Indians by lowering them into a pit of flames. And I was like stunned. I go, wait a minute, wh why is this teacher informing these young Latino children that their ancestors were engaged in such horrific practices when I in fact knew, uh, because I'd done the research, that those three pits were in fact barbecue pits that had been installed, yes, by the Mutsun Indians of the mission in concert with the Portuguese parishioners back in the 1930s, literally a century after the demise of the mission enterprise. So, and I heard this over and over and over, and I have often, not so much confronted it, 
but I tried to introduce and educate. And that often hasn't gone well for me. And even so, I'm, I, I got a thick skin. I've been through a lot of battles. And so I'm willing to take this on. I'm willing to bring it into question. I'm willing to interrogate it until I begin to see the kind of evidence attributable specifically to Junipero Serra, I have to take pause uh, and, and really think through what it is people are saying. I understand the question of historical trauma. It is very clear. My community, uh, the Yaquis, Yaqui Indians, have been persecuted uh, by, by first other groups like the Apaches. My grandmother talks about that. By the Spanish who entered the region by the Mexicans, and then later by the Americans. They have been uh, set upon by virtually every group. And yet, I don't reject the Americans. I am now one. I don't reject the Mexicans. I are one, too. And then I don't reject the Spanish, or for that matter, the Apaches. Uh, but they were people who were uh, part of the problem for my ancestors. So what I want to do, and I will, having said my piece about the Malinche complex, where we are torn by our indigenous and Hispanicist identities, uh, I want to get into Junipero Serra and his legacy, because that's really what we're here for today. So I will go ahead and uh, shift. Uh, I probably need to share my screen so I can share the PowerPoint. Mike. I've, I've got it. Uh, yeah. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Okay, this is just an opening salvo image, uh, just to acknowledge the title of the presentation. First of all, I'd like to say that when it comes to California, and I might note that Arnold Schwarzenegger did in fact have it right, California. Uh, uh, and uh, California has often been misconstrued and misidentified, whether topographically, in terms of legend, uh, the legends of Esplandine, in which California was thought to be an island inhabited by gorgeous uh, African Amazons who would uh, take shipwrecked sailors, reproduce with them, and like a black widow would kill them. Uh, of course, many sailors uh, were curious and wanted to come to this island with all these gorgeous African females. Well, that's not quite what they found. Uh, instead, uh, California remained uh, conceived of as an island, literally for centuries, even though uh, Father Kino, who's currently under consideration for canonization, was actually able to identify the fact that it wasn't an island and part of the landmass uh, we now call California named after Queen Califia, an African Amazon, who essentially was named after the notion of the caliphate, which is, of course, an Islamic term. My interest in the region uh, began with that project at Mission San Juan Bautista. And you note here that uh, I was doing archaeological investigations at this site as of 1996. And we soon began to recover foundation footings, in this case of the ancient uh, granary at the site. But as I was doing this work, I found myself being beset uh, by individuals that questioned why I would want to work in a California mission. I had archaeologists from this area who would approach me and then basically say, you're wasting your time. This site has been desecrated and destroyed, literally to expose the next foundation or building right under their feet. Uh, I continued to do the research, and as I began to look through the documents, I kept encountering uh, the idea of Junipero Serra on every level. And as I've mentioned, because of uh, my upbringing, I, I looked at individuals like this suspiciously. And I remember even telling a couple of pastors that Junipero Serra and I don't get along. And that was when I was excavating at the Carmel Mission uh, back in the period of 2003 to 2005. Ultimately, I would be called upon uh, by uh, the, the curator uh, at the Diocese of Monterey, uh, Sir Richard Mann, who's grown to be a great friend of mine, uh, to undertake an archaeological investigation and a monitoring so that they could put in French drains at the San Carlos Cathedral uh, here in Monterey. Uh, in the end, during the course of the excavations, uh, my crew and I discovered the original Sarah Chapel. You're looking at it there on the right. Those are the stones, the granite boulders used to create the pavers 
And in the middle of the floor were eight bluish boulders that were unlike anything I'd seen anywhere in the region. I have reason to believe that these boulders came from the Southland and they were implanted as part of the Franciscan identification with the number eight and uh, the symbolism of all of that. These are uh, elements. You see some of the bl uh, blue stones that are uh, being uh, cleaned there, as well as the foundation footings. And one of the things that inspired me to look more closely at Junipero Serra, because as I've noted, up until this time, uh, as of 2006, when I began this project, and it wasn't until 2008 that we discovered the chapel, I was still a skeptic of Serra and many dimensions of the mission enterprise. Uh, I felt that I had to keep my head down because every time I turned around, somebody would attack me for doing the scholarship on the missions. To me, uh, I've known intrepid archaeologists who went into some of the most dangerous conflict zones to get at the truth. That's what I was after, uh, regardless of who was attempting to distort that truth. So I tried to keep my head down and get at the facts. It wasn't until we were about, uh, uh, just after exposing this building, I began to have issues with the contractors and engineers at the site who wanted to literally bulldoze right through this structure. And I would not let them do that. And I fought them. And ultimately, it wasn't until it made front page headlines uh, that the contractors and the engineers were glad that they had helped save the building, which was ironic given their previous position. Uh, in the end, uh, knowing that we had saved the building, I remember standing uh, uh, on what would have been the sanctuary area, which still had its original Roman mortar pavement. And at that time, I recall walking over there and being almost possessed by a feeling that my ancestors had been in this place. And it was almost as though they had all entered into my spirit and I could name them, each of them. Uh, you know, uh, whether it was Father Cresti or Anza or many of the indigenous peoples who worshiped in this place, uh, I literally stood there and I was so overcome by that moment, I fell to my knees and I made the sign of the cross. And while for some you know, who are detractors of the church, who don't identify with these forms of spirituality, especially institutionalized spirituality, I knew in that moment that I needed to rededicate or rethink my prior position. And since that time, my efforts have been to understand Sarah more fully. And I found myself pulled into this vortex of competing claims that address the issues of who Junipero Serra was or was not. Ultimately at San Carlos, uh, you know, there were many firsts at that site. We found multiple buildings, the baptistry, the sacristy, the defensive walls of what had been this Presidio fort. And it was clear that Junipero Serra did not want to be identified with the soldiers. He did not want to be identified with the civilian government. And it was at that point, and no sooner than he had completed uh, the chapel that I discovered from 1772, he moved his mission San Carlos de Monterrey to the area that we now identify as the Carmel Mission along the Rio Carmelo. By the way, this, was, uh, this photo was taken when we had just received uh, the statue of La Guadalupana, had just been returned from uh, uh, LA where it, it literally had a uh, total makeover because it had been uh, eaten by the salts of the area and it was about to be reinstalled in this location. It is the earliest such image west of the Mississippi. Miguel Joseph Serra y Ferrer, which is what his name was, which I thought was interesting that uh, the link that I received had Ferrer as uh, the name. But uh, he was essentially uh, born on November 24th of 1713. He passed away on August 28th of 1784. And it wasn't until September 25th of 1988 that he was beatified. Uh, and then later canonized on September 23rd, 2015. Many who identify with Sarah tend to think that Sarah lived in these wonderful, wonderfully constructed buildings. In reality, Sarah's letters make clear that he was living in thatched huts for much of his career in California. Uh, he lived in an adobe towards the end, which was not fully uh, tiled uh, and it would leak like a sieve. Uh, on one occasion and in one letter uh, that I have, 
he literally is concerned because he sent the Indians back into the mountains, the SLN and the Rumsian, so that they could forage because the mission's uh, wheat crop had failed. And he, he left it to them to go find and forage for themselves. And he begged that a soldier who was about to be court-martialed for going AWOL not be court-martialed, but rather be allowed to stay with Father Crespi, who was deathly ill, and himself, and harvest what little they could of what remained of the crop. Uh, so these were the kinds of uh, issues and challenges on this frontier of the Spanish vice royalty. It was not a frontier to the indigenous communities because they had been here for thousands of years. Uh, they were embedded in these regions and they knew the landscape and the resources better than anyone. And so this was a necessary collaboration. But again, the building that we see was built much later, not completed until 1797, and Sarah never saw this building. So who was Sarah? When we talk about Junipero Serra, and I, I don't presently know if this statue survived uh, the recent uh, uh, pattern of uh, monument topplings, uh, but it's one that was in San Diego when I photographed it. The house that you see in the upper right is the upper story of uh, Junipero Serra's home in Petra, Mallorca. So you can see that many of the elements that would have characterized the California mission were literally inherent to the way he lived as a child. Sarah was a very sickly child. In fact, uh, that only worsened through time. His family uh, did not believe he would survive. In fact, uh, half of his family perished uh, to epidemics in Petra. Uh, they died, uh, uh, there was infant mortality involved. And of course, Sarah was uh, uh, very sickly. So his parents, uh, even though he helped in the fields because they were essentially campesinos, uh, farm workers, uh, they had a small plot of land, like a sharecropper. Uh, the family decided to send him over to the church uh, to sing because that was what he was good at. So he sang in the church and eventually determined that he wanted to be a Franciscan. Uh, and the church I've been into, it's only a block away from his home. You note that in the image to the bottom, we have an image of the port uh, at Palma, and it was a place that had been invaded by virtually every group imaginable. In fact, the book that I just completed called The Spanish Style House chronicles this series of invasions by dozens and dozens of major civilizations through the course of a thousand years. And in this particular case, you see Islamic or Mudejar. Uh, you see, uh, you know, you have, of course, various groups, including Visigoths and others who swept through the region. Uh, at, from one point to another. The church, La Iglesia de San Pietro in Petra, Mallorca, was where Junipero Serra was baptized, and this is the original baptismal font within which he was baptized. We see a painting in the museum there in Petra, which is the Serra Museum, and this is a stylized characterization of what Serra did when he finally arrived in Monterey. So they see him as a point of pride there. Uh, but I'm also told that statues to Sarah there in his own town have also been vandalized. Uh, here you see some of the imagery of the Mudejar fortress of the Alhambra on the upper right. And of course, the Roman elements. And of course, uh, uh, the blessed Ramon Lul, who was a 13th century um, Catholic mystic, uh, who's credited uh, with binary code. Uh, which is the basis for our computing systems. Uh, he also uh, had a rather checkered life, a personal life, I might add, that I won't go into, which basically precluded the possibilities of him getting through the entire process of sanctification. The church in which Junipero Serra was both a professor as well as a minister is uh, this here. This is the Iglesia del Claustro de San Francisco in Palma, Mallorca. Uh, so Sarah had great digs. He uh, was uh, considered a renowned professor. He was said to be able to speak in words of gold and write in the hand of gold, uh, such that those that uh, uh, were seeking the Lord would come to him because he was a renowned professor. So now imagine this. You are a renowned professor in the heart of one of the greatest, well, one of the epicenters of the Catholic faith in the Mediterranean, and one day you decide to practice what you preach because you've sent 
you know, some of your students off to the New World, uh, into the Americas, uh, to minister, to evangelize. Well, Sarah was not happy with that. He had everything going for him. He was ready to retire in reality at a very uh, relatively early age. By age 35, he had reached the pinnacle of everything he could do in a place uh, like Mallorca. Uh, and Mallorca was surrounded by many of the relics and elements that are identified uh, across the, the Catholic community and throughout Christianity. For example, Spain, in case uh, you've ever uh, watched Monty Python, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, a, a motion picture that was uh, the search for the Holy Grail. Well, does anybody know where the Holy Grail might be? It's in Valencia, Spain. Uh, it is there and it is actually an earthen goblet. You see it up here but it's been surrounded by a host of, uh, of, of metal objects to protect it. Um, that was amazing to see the Holy Grail there in Valencia. Also the medieval relics like this box in the lower right is said to represent uh, pieces of bread from the Last Supper. When I first saw it, I thought it was a seized candy box. Uh, although Sarah talked much about the sweetness of the Lord, I don't think that's what he meant. So this was also one of the churches that Sarah ministered in. This is in Palma Mallorca. This is the cathedral. He was again at the top of his game and so far as a minister of the Lord and as a Franciscan could go unless uh, falling short of becoming a bishop or a pope. But he was a scholar. He was a professor. That was his devotion. And now he wanted to minister and teach among the peoples of the New World, the American Indian. He arrives uh, in Mexico City after a tumultuous uh, voyage uh, over a very choppy sea through a storm that nearly sunk the ship in 1749. Uh, in fact, before Sarah left, he didn't have the heart to tell his parents that he was going to be leaving them because they were elderly and infirm. Uh, his siblings had already uh, either died or departed. And so he left it to a, a dear friend uh, who lived in Palma, to return from Cadiz, which is in Spain, back to Mallorca and to carry a letter written by Sarah to acknowledge that he was departing and he did not have the, the uh, heart to tell them directly uh, uh, the feeling of loss that he was feeling at having to leave his parents behind. Uh, but his devotion was to the American Indian and all that they represented to him at that point. Uh, the letter that he wrote was at part of the Huntington Library exhibition uh, in Los Angeles, Pasadena. And uh, I remember seeing the letter and you can actually see what appears to be uh, tears that washed some of the ink across the page. And it's likely, and some have interpreted this, as the tears of Sarah writing to his parents and heartbroken at the prospect of having to leave. Ultimately, Sarah did leave. Uh, he, arrived, uh, he arrived in Mexico uh, in 1749. And unlike the other friars, about a dozen of them that arrived with him, he chose to walk because he would not, uh, he did not want a horse. He would not take a horse because Jesus only rode mules. His feeling was he wanted to live the life of, of the Messiah. He wanted to feel the same anguish and sufferings and joy that the Messiah felt in his daily life. And so Sarah, uh, along with one other friar, walked the entire distance from La Via Rica de la Vera Cruz, or Vera Cruz for short, and they walked through the mountainous and craggy region with no resources. I don't know how many of you have ever traveled uh, across country without a dime to your name. Well, I've done it all over Latin America since I was 17. I'll show up someplace, no money, and people would come out of the woodwork to help me. Uh, so I know Latin America on a very different level. Uh, the people are, are wonderful. Um, and Sarah uh, relied on charity uh, or on whatever was available on the landscape. And he made his way to Mexico City. And in route, he was bitten uh, by an insect that caused a flesh eating disease, which I have since uh, identified, uh, actually I've identified the disease. It's not yet published, so I, I'm gonna have to refrain from presenting that, but it was in fact a flesh-eating disease. 
that left open sores in his legs and his feet would often swell uh, such that he couldn't wear footwear. Uh, and he would be in severe pain to the point where he couldn't walk and yet he insisted on walking everywhere. So he was a contradiction on many different levels. Most of us with that kind of almost gangrenous infection uh, would have uh, chosen to find other uh, modes of transportation. Once in Mexico City, Sarah's first night, he camped out at what has become the Basilica of Guadalupe because he was a devotee of La Guadalupana. For him, she was the Indian Madonna. And from there, after you know, paying homage to her, he went to the Colegio de San Fernando. And it is there that it is said by his fellow friars that he would not allow you know, because they would have a, a young man come in to clean out the facilities every day. Well, Sarah would not let them do that. He would take uh, the dust pans, the trash buckets, and the brooms, and he would sweep the halls himself. And even though he was um, a, uh, a highly revered scholar and professor who was often chastised for doing the work of these young Indian men, uh, he insisted uh, because he felt that in order to remain humble and focused on charity and humility, one had to be able to do these things. So many of the things that speak to who Sarah was sound contradictory, but still follow a pattern that are clearly part of his philosophy of life and his respect for indigenous communities as per the leyes de las Indias, which were the laws that protected indigenous peoples in the Americas. Like our laws, you might imagine, not everybody follows them. Uh, for example, uh, if I were to ask how many of you have uh, maybe pressed the gas pedal a little too hard and done 70 in a 50 mile zone, uh, how many of you have perhaps trespassed? How many of you have done things you now regret? Uh, maybe some of you have been in conflicts where people were hurt. Uh, well, Sarah was one of those individuals that lived within that framework of that time attempting to abide by the leyes de las Indias and the protection of native peoples. And while there are many detractors, they clearly do not understand what the leyes de las Indias were or Sarah's devotion to the indigenous community. Sarah was an itinerant missionary. Uh, he actually was in Cuba. He was, he was all in Oaxaca. He went into Querétaro where he founded five missions. He was reassigned after the expulsion of the Jesuits to Baja California. And he was literally walking in the shadow of some rather brutal um, uh, political agendas of the day. Uh, the Jesuits who had grown powerful and wealthy uh, were seen as a threat by clearly uh, the, 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 the king and queen. Uh, and they were being basically prompted to see through the expulsion of the Jesuits. For those of you that might have seen the movie The Mission with Robert De Niro playing Capitan Mendoza, uh, then you would understand that there were all kinds of mixed messages going back and forth, and the church was caught in the middle of, of what could potentially be the breakaway of Portugal from uh, the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, the Protestants had already done it. They didn't want to see a repeat, and so the church turned a blind eye to what the Portuguese were doing. Once in Baja California, the tide had changed and, and the political currents of the time had basically buffeted you know, Spain's uh, declining fortunes because this was the age, end of the age of exploration. Uh, this was the end of uh, the Viceroyalty's power. Uh, its resources were being depleted and Sarah was dispatched uh, to Baja California and then from there into Alta California. Sarah finally had his opportunity to work with indigenous communities who had not had contact with Europeans. I often get the impression that he didn't much care for Europeans. It's pretty clear. Uh, if, if, you know, he had problems with the military. He had problems with civilians. He tried to maintain the missions in areas in their original tribal communities, but away from European settlement. He was concerned about disease vectors. He was concerned about exploitation. And so these were, in effect, isolated communes in his day. Of course, today, California real estate um, uh, basically dictates otherwise. Everybody wants to live on the coast. 
Well, in those days, some 60,000 Native Americans lived along the coast who were identified with all of the missions of California through its 50 year uh, period of existence. The sacred expedition uh, that Sarah embarked on from Baja California uh, was one of those things that he had uh, had as a desire from day one. He had heard stories about the exploration of the coast by Carrillo and by all those who followed, including Vizcaino, uh, and ultimately uh, felt that this was the place where he needed to establish his ministry. In fact, more so than San Diego, California, he was looking to establish himself in Monterrey, where ultimately he built the Cabecera, uh, ultimately at Carmel Mission. The Cabecera being the lead mission. Of course, in coming to California, Alta California, Sarah often speaks uh, of his encounters with native peoples. Anytime that he came and encountered native peoples, he often spoke lovingly of them. He would share figs with them. They would share fish with him. Uh, and then he would uh, write at length about, it, it was like a child writing. He was, he was talking about being mesmerized by these people that were so close to God. And you could almost argue that in Dios, in Dios means in God. Of course, the Chumash were one of the groups that, and I have a number of quotes and uh, I won't show this now, but uh, there are a number of documents that have been translated and Sarah had a commitment to the Chumash because he, he makes clear that he saw them as a particularly loving people, a people who had come to his assistance repeatedly. And yet he had a temerity about them because they lived in such large villages. There were literally hundreds and thousands of them along the coast. And they were uh, well armed. Uh, they were equipped to bring conflict to the Spanish if they cared to, and they didn't do that. And for this reason, Sarah felt all that uh, all the more strongly about uh, the need to live among them and work among them. And he committed early on to the establishment of a mission San Buenaventura. And of course, here we see images of Salinan on the left, and of course, a Chumash rock art on the right. So again, the indigenous cosmologies of the region were many and diverse, and they needed to be understood within the context of a community and a spirituality that was clearly distinctive from that of uh, the Catholic Church. And yet, Sarah used structures like this uh, in many of his ministries. He would go from indigenous village to indigenous village, uh, often at, you know, for extended periods of time, sometimes several years at a time, in order to commune with native peoples and live amongst them. During the sacred expedition, of course, uh, there was both a land-based expedition that Sarah was a part of, and then a seaborne expedition. And the coast of California was treacherous on so many levels. Uh, it would be a place where many ships would flounder, especially in Baja California. But it was also a, a, uh, a place that the, uh, the, the Spanish vice royalty uh, needed a place in which the Manila galleons could dock. And Monterey had been determined early on, uh, as late as the late 16 and early 1700s, that this was the place that these ships could be restocked before they made the perilous journey southward uh, to uh, basically the various ports along the coast, including Acapulco. Uh, some of the images you see here uh, are indicative, representative, iconographic of the images that would have been seen by Sarah or the kinds of clothing like the gray sackcloth that he would have worn. There are many images and depictions of Junipero Serra, uh, not all of them uh, particularly accurate. Uh, in fact, uh, while there are many who live by the image of him to the left, uh, that may be to some extent accurate, although the image at the center appears to be one that is more closely identified with what he likely looked like. Uh, you see the image in the lower left, uh, which is that of Sarah, basically, uh, on June 3rd of 1770, holding mass under the tree identified as the Sarah tree today, but it was where a mass had been conducted by the priest accompanying uh, Vizcaino in 1602. So the first official Catholic mass in California occurred in Monterey in 1602. 
And while the image is rather idyllic, uh, it even portrays native peoples in, in a rather odd way. Uh, you don't see the whole picture here. Uh, some of them are over to the right. Uh, you nevertheless see the characteristics of the landscape that would have been inherent to that time. Uh, I, I decided to take a few quotes because I've been seeing some rather egregious and uh, I would think of them as uh, almost non sequiturs given what I know of Sarah. Also, um, there are many dimensions to Sarah's life that often are never addressed. Uh, some of the things that appear on the internet that have recently been appearing specifically, for example, in a petition to have Sarah's statue removed from a mission Santa Inez. And I might note, Sarah did not found that mission. He had been, he had uh, passed away nearly 20 years before the founding of the mission. And the statue itself is on private property. It's on the church property there. And I might also note that it was that mission that fought for years, the friars there fought for years to assure that the American government did not dispossess the Chumash of their tribal lands. So the lands identified with the mission were turned over to the Chumash, which is why their reservation has survived. Uh, again, this was an effort on the part of the missionaries and the Catholic Church at Santa Inez. So I find it ironic that people would uh, basically um, use uh, characterizations, uh, ad hominem attacks on a man who died well, well over 250 years ago. Uh, he's not here to defend himself, but were you to go to his writings, you would begin to understand that he had a very different vision for what he was dealing with. And I assure you, very few of you uh, that are here today would have endured uh, the violence to your body, the violence to your soul, that Sarah endured as a result of the conflicts that he had to intervene in, in dealing with the military soldiers who had uh, committed actions against native peoples who he sought to have prosecuted. These are uh, the words of Junipero Serra as have been recorded uh, by uh, uh, Rosemary Beebe and Dr. Robert Senkowitz, both uh, doctors. Uh, here he says, we found on our journey as well as in the place where we stopped that they treated us with as much confidence and goodwill as if they had known us all their lives. That doesn't sound like the Sarah I've been hearing about lately to justify the desecration of his life, heritage, and contribution. Another statement, we have seen Indians in immense numbers and all those on this coast of the Pacific contrive to make a good subsistence on various seeds and by fishing, he is describing the Chumash. The truth is that I have always found the poor Gentiles uh, to be very loving. The greatest danger occurs when an unjust act on the part of the soldiers incites the Gentiles, which has happened. So he himself acknowledges the depredation of some of those around him. And yet his greatest fear is for the soldiers, the military, and the civilian explorers to come in and destroy the loving relationship that he had hoped to build with these communities. Uh, you might also note that he uses the word Gentile. And for those of you that uh, know the term, you know that it is not derogatory. It simply means, uh, in other words, you're not Christian. Uh, other than, uh, and there were, and this is in a time when there were plenty of those who would use more derogatory characterizations of indigenous peoples. Sarah did not. I have yet to find documentation to that effect uh, some people say he called uh, native people savages. I've never found that to be the case. And yet I have found that in military documents and by military commanders who thought less of, Indi of the indigenous peoples. And yet Sarah was the only buffer between the military onslaught of the California Indian and the evangelization of the native peoples. For those of you that are politicized to believe that evangelization is the worst thing that could have happened. I can assure you, I've seen the consequences of what happened in far more egregious cases where there was no one standing in the way of the military. Um, finally, Junipero Serra says, one time when the ground was so muddy, I could not travel on foot or on horseback. They took hold of my arms and carried me a great distance until they could set me down on firmer ground. 
This was a group of, of Chumash Indians in a, in, a, in a huge settlement that actually caused some temerity among the soldiers. They were afraid they were going to be attacked because they were well armed. But they saw Sarah. Sarah was a man no more than about five foot four. And for those of you that are no more than five foot four, you will understand that those that you know, surround us can have issues with your height. Well, Sarah actually was often, more often than not, the same height as the indigenous communities in which he alighted. Uh, he uh, clearly drew the reverence of the people there who when they saw that he was having difficulty crossing a riverbed filled with mud, they literally lifted them onto his shoulders and they carried him across the stream. Sarah remembered this in virtually everything he did from that point onward. And bear in mind, this was early on. This was in the 1769 expedition and he never forgot this and wanted to go back to the area of San Buenaventura to work with the Chumash who he had only the greatest reverence for. Of course, what Sarah gets blamed for is that the indigenous communities went from the people on the left to the people on the right. Uh, he, is, he is accused of having evangelized, having educated in European ways. Uh, he is uh, uh, condemned for being a colonial agent. Well, I can tell you, and I've had blonde haired, blue eyed colleagues, uh, that's, I'm not saying that to be derogatory, but who, when I've asked them, why do you hate Sarah so much? Because they, they're not Catholic. Uh, they haven't read about Sarah. They only know what they know through the internet. And they'll say, well, he was a colonial agent. And because this was a colleague who works for the state university, I asked them, who signs your paycheck? And the response was, well, the state of California. And I says, well, is that not a product of colonialism? Are we not fish attempting to change the ocean by virtue of swimming in it? Uh, we can make this a better world, you know, whether it be Black Lives Matter or other concerned Catholic community agents who have worked towards social justice, we can make this a better world. But to simply uh, use ad hominem attacks on the dead is a form of historical presentism, which basically tells me that you think you are better than the dead. Uh, which I find unfortunate because I revere all of my ancestors, both indigenous and Hispanic. You know, I am that young boy who grew up being told Indians were evil. Uh, that's why John Wayne has the gun them down every day on television. That's what I grew up with. Uh, and then to be told, oh, the Spaniards, they're all gachupinas. Uh, they are the people who destroyed our culture. And so we have to butt heads over that very issue. For me, whether I am a Hispanicized, because I am Hispanicized. I have a last name by the name of Mendoza. Mendoza is a Hispanic surname. It is of Hispania, the Iberian Peninsula. I am proud of my ancestors. And for me to uh, eliminate that name would invalidate the ancestors who brought me into this world. Uh, that's not to say I don't have issues with colonialism, because I clearly do. I study the, the conflicts and the contradictions of colonialism. So uh, we're going we're gonna to open, uh, I'm going to have the guy open up, uh, 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 Mike Doyle, if you'd open up the uh, comment section, uh, just to begin to receive questions. Okay. Okay. I'm looking for, okay, let me stop. Uh, I'll stop here. Let's see. Okay. Okay, he's, he's just going to, we're opening up the comment section. If you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and, and put them in. Uh, Ruben, you can, uh, you want, want to summarize, please uh, uh, continue. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, basically, I, I have a few images related to the canonization, but I think I've said most of what I wanted to convey with respect to Sarah. Uh, the elements of the legacy that I feel are important to note, uh, whether visually or in this way, uh, is that Sarah introduced many of the primary dimensions that make up the political economy of the fifth largest economy in the world, California. Uh, whether it's viticulture, um, agriculture, uh, stock raising, uh, a metallurgy, uh, urban planning, uh, and a whole host of other dimensions, including uh, the, the creation of topographic maps, 
the creation of the first medical treatises to uh, address smallpox in places like Baja California. All of these were introduced at that. And what I see happening today, unfortunately, is that my own community has taken to assisting in the desecration of the Hispanic Catholic tradition because they don't identify with the term Hispanic. So let's put it this way, Mexican Indian, which is my heritage, that tradition was very much central to the build out of California and the emergence of the California tradition. What we are essentially dealing with in my mind is the fact that we are now part and parcel of an effort to diminish the existence of a California foundational or origin story that can be identified with Hispanic Catholic people, i.e. Mexican, Mexican Indian and others who identify with Mexico or other elements of Latin America. So for me, uh, this is uh, problematic. Okay. Oh, we don't have any questions yet, but I, I, I have a question. I just, uh, I, was, uh, I was reading that uh, book that you had suggested um, on, on Sarah. And one of, one of the comments was, um, was that uh, during Sarah's time that the, the, the native peoples pretty much flourished? It, well, off and on, the, the the death rate was pretty low. But but once uh, once uh, once he passed away and it was another priest took over uh, by by 1820 apparently that the exact op opposite was happening. People were dying. I mean, natives were dying in, in large numbers at the missions. Yes. Uh, so so what, what what accounts for that? Uh, I mean, is there a particular political thing that happens in that, in that period? Well, I, I do know, and uh, there is no excusing what happened, but I, I can tell you there are large numbers of people dying in 21st century America right now. Over 150,000 Americans have died needlessly. And yet, how many of us can claim that we've done anything to stop that? Surely Junipero Serra did not have the instrumentation, the technology, or the resources to stop the onslaught of something that had begun years before. In fact, it is very clear based on the fact that it was, uh, uh, it was more than a two week journey. The incubation period for viruses is roughly 14 days if you wanna look at the outset. Uh, and smallpox in particular could not have been brought from uh, uh, basically from the South in fact, there are reasons to believe that the smallpox epidemics that first struck California came from the north and from the Russian settlements at places like Port Ross. Uh, and uh, so because that was more proximate to the areas where the infection broke out in the San Francisco Bay. To get from Acapulco uh, to uh, Alta California would have taken well over two weeks. Uh, and the Spanish were engaged in isolating any travelers before they got anywhere near Native Americans. So there were efforts. In fact, I published on the fact that the first variolation or inoculation of any people in North America was being conducted in the 1780s by the missionaries on the California Indians to protect them from smallpox. There was in fact a, in fact, we get the term uh, vaccination from vaca, you know, vaca, cow cowpox. By taking cattle that were infected with cowpox, you could safely conduct a variolation by simply uh, pricking the area between uh, the thumb and forefinger, and the person had a much better chance of surviving because they were now technically immune as per vaccination. Over 20,000 Native Americans were vaccinated uh, by the so-called uh, Spaniards, really friars, because they were at the head of this, and they saved the California Indian from total devastation. That's not to say that they had any way of stopping other diseases, because gonorrhea was a fact. Nobody wants to talk about that. Uh, it, it did lead to sterility among Indian women. And I can tell you that one of the uh, incidents that Father Sarah is accused of uh, insofar as flogging, he learned that an indigenous alcalde from the Carmel Mission uh, an alcalde is the equivalent of a sheriff or a mayor, had been prostituting excellent Indian women to the Spanish soldiers. And Sarah was so outraged 
uh, he literally sent that individual to Presidio to be flogged. So the question is, uh, what would you have done if the women in your own tribe were being prostituted by someone you had trusted? Uh, the next individual, and there, there's a host of these, uh, you can go to Tibisar's translations of Sarah's diaries, because Sarah was outraged. She's talking about these things. Was another where an alcalde uh, basically took it upon himself to mer uh, met out a, a floggings uh, as retaliation for perceived slights. Sarah sent that individual to Presidio to be uh, punished. So, so there was always a reason. Sarah did not do this uh, uh, you know, uh, willy-nilly. He, he wasn't pernicious in his behavior. He, was, uh, he, he felt that maintaining uh, the viability of a parish community or a community of Christians was, uh, was a bigger directive. It was a divine mandate over alienating the very people that he cared about. I do see questions uh, sure. cropping up. Uh, I, I can I'll go to here. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, let's see. Um, uh, one is, uh, Mr. Mendoza, what can you or uh, we do so that you could get this message out through mainstream national media to educate people about the good intentions of Father Sarah? You know, it, it's interesting because I get people on the other end of the spectrum asking me. I, I was once... Uh, 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 the American Indian Movement, Southern California trap, uh, chapter, tried to recruit me to tell their story. And I am an indigenous, but I also know that when we engage in ad hominem attacks against historical personalities, we need to have our facts straight. And so what I tell my students, I don't care where you position yourself with respect to the value or the, the problems related to the missions. I need you to document your beliefs. In other words, where are these coming from? Because we can all have opinions, but we don't all have facts. And so for this question, uh, what can we do? I, I think that what, uh, whether you are doing this out of uh, faith in your heritage uh, or faith in your church or faith in the person of Junipero Serra, San Junipero Serra or Saint Junipero Serra, then I think that it comes down to individuals because I didn't come here to change anybody's mind. I came here to present the facts as I understand them. Uh, I respect concerns about historical trauma. I do believe that is very real. I've seen it in the African-American, indigenous, Asian, and other communities. We as human beings are very good at inflicting historical trauma on one another and then excusing ourselves for having done so. Uh, so I would say to this individual that uh, Learn as much as you can. I'm not saying go out and become scholars uh, like Father Gill is attempting to do here with respect to Father Sarah, because he's now reading uh, the, the documents uh, through various publications. But I, I do believe that rather than take the word of individuals on the street, and anytime you see a petition, uh, let's interrogate those in much the same way that many of you now feel the need to interrogate Capitol Hill or uh, interrogate the White House. And, and bring into question the narratives because there's no documentation often to back those up. You know, I don't wanna politicize what our country is going through right now, but just bear in mind, just as you feel powerless for the caging of Mexican children and Central American children on the border, you feel powerless. Can you imagine what Father Sarah felt when he learned of uh, the atrocities being conducted by some Spanish soldiers? He went all the way to Mexico City to address those with the Viceroy. It was an unheralded meeting. It took him almost a year to you know, literally travel back to Mexico, write up a 32 point uh, uh, praesis on things that he was demanding, including the firing of the commander, uh, uh, Pedro Pages from the Monterey Presidio for uh, willful neglect of duty in protecting the Indians. You know, some people say, oh yeah, but he did that just because he needed slaves. Well, again, slavery, was illegal in uh, the Viceroyalty of New Spain. So unless you're saying he was breaking the law and he was very much one to align himself with respecting the laws of the Indies, then that's a whole nother thing. Again, I, I think it comes down to each and every one of us, you know, uh, 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 drawing from the existing evidence, uh, question when you see petitions that uh, basically, uh, use ad hominem attacks without documentation. 
uh, that's all I ask because I do believe that if you can, if you can, if, if those individuals are documenting what they're actually saying, some of them are saying Father Sarah was raping women, indigenous women, that he was murdering people, he was flogging them. There's not a single account from anyone that Sarah ever lifted a hand against a Native American. In fact, he intervened to save several of them uh, from capital punishment because the soldiers were gonna have them executed. Uh, five Indians at uh, uh, Kumeye uh, at San Diego were saved by virtue of his inter interference. Uh, but again, uh, documentation, documentation. Uh, Ruben, uh, one of those questions, that next question, if Sarah were alive today, perhaps he might condone the removal of the statues of himself. Uh, uh, maybe, I mean, having read some of uh, his letters and documentation, he, he does come across as a uh, as, as very self-effacing on, on the one hand. So, but, but, but every, every good Catholic boy wants to be a saint, and every Catholic woman wants to be a saint. Anyway, what, uh, otherwise, what's the point? But, uh, but you, you mentioned to me that you would be involved with the conversations at Ventura and their decision to remove the statue from a public space. Can, can you, in light of this question, can you, can you address that a little bit? Yeah, let, let me uh, couch that within uh, two incidents. Uh, in, uh, in, in 2015, I was invited to the Vatican uh, as a scholar to present information from the archeological perspective and ethno-historical dimensions of what happened at Monterey. Uh, shortly after I returned, I was called upon to testify at the state legislature about a proposal by uh, legislator Lara to remove the statue of Sarah from the Capitol Rotunda in Washington, DC. And I basically came in and through the course of the night, I generated a list of what I could call contributions that are directly pertinent to the history of California now that can be attributed to Sarah. I presented that list and I turned to Representative Lara and I basically said, I find it incredible that a person of Mexican descent would find it appropriate to remove the only Hispanic Catholic represented anywhere on Capitol Hill to erase that dimension of an American history is egregious uh, until you can come up with someone else that reflects the true contribution of the Mexican, Latino, Hispanic. I, I don't care about monikers. I, you can call me whatever you will, Chicano. Uh, uh, those terms don't mean anything to me unless we have a unified vision for who we are as a people. And that, for that reason, I'm willing to move from one end of the spectrum to the other in order to argue for the facts related to our ancestors, and Sarah is one of those. We saved the statue on Capitol Hill, but unfortunately, the statue at Sacramento was desecrated. And the one at Ventura, and I have talked uh, to Native American elders there who have been very honorable and very respectful, and they too wanted to avoid uh, the travesty of the statue being desecrated. And they worked with Father Elo, uh, you know, the father there at the mission uh, at San Buenaventura to make sure that there were some alternatives. I sat in on the meeting because I had uh, several people who wanted me to step in. To be honest with you, I thought, you know what, given what's already happened, I don't know that I can change this game, but I am a historic preservationist and I went in prepared to argue for that dimension Several people in front of me had already clearly knew, their, uh, knew what they were talking about because they too were historic preservationists and they argued for the historical and heritage significance of the statue. And it does have that significance. But the only question that was being addressed at that meeting was, is it a historically significant monument? And by that standard, because it's a reproduction from 1989, it did not meet the criteria. And that I can't argue against, but I did assert the importance of Sarah in the founding of the last mission that he was responsible for, San Buenaventura, uh, and his contributions to the political economy of California and to the protection of indigenous peoples. Uh, that didn't wash, uh, it, it was deemed non-historical. And then the city council who I understand were probably shake, quaking in their boots about the potential uh, vandalism of the statue, voted to have it removed and turned over to the church, which I, I still see as appropriate. At least it hasn't been desecrated. Uh, those who do the desecrations will in turn find that those things that they care about 
in the future shall also be desecrated. Mm. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I kind of been piggybacking with some of these questions. Uh, there's a question about uh, about what resources uh, that would be uh, book, good books to read uh, uh, for California history. But but uh, be before we get to that. Uh, one of the questions is one of the critiques of the mission period is that the indigenous people were indentured or enslaved with lack of freedom or options to leave. Uh, could you clarify the veracity or, or not of that critique? Yes. Missions uh, were essentially set up as the equivalent of communes. And uh, we have American communes today that uh, go from one end of the spectrum to the other insofar as individual liberties, uh, because everybody is contributing to the collective enterprise. Uh, and let's face it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a professor. Uh, one of the things that students often hate is when I put them into groups to collaborate with one another. You invariably have some who will not cooperate, who will not contribute, and the rest are then alienated from them. But the reality is, is that there clearly was a transformative or transitional period where people are becoming acculturated, but even some of the, the key scholars on this question, like Sandoz, makes clear that Native peoples were never fully acculturated. They were never fully converted. They may have been baptized. Uh, some of them uh, may have been confirmed, but they still had many of their indigenous lifeways intact. I know this archeologically. For example, at Mission Soledad, we recovered the, uh, basically what I, I refer to as the Indian compound. It was one of the largest uh, in the Californias. And it was clear that indigenous peoples there were still attuned to their native lifeways there in the shadow of the Padres. Their relatives were moving on, to, on site with their uh, traditional uh, housing. And we see this in images from the California period. Uh, the issue with not being able to leave has to do with and again, this is a cosmology. This is a belief system that was inherent to that time. When a friar, when you as a Native American chose to accept conversion, what does that mean? And, and I will acknowledge that many Native Americans probably didn't fully understand what they were committing to. Uh, but they knew that there were perks, uh, there were opportunities, there was housing, there were pots and pans, there were knives, there was food. All of these things were part of that package. And you might say, well, some of them may have been seduced into accepting the deal. They would come in, but from the perspective of the friar, once accepted into the church for conversion and baptism, it was the friar's responsibility, literally uh, in, in, incumbent on his soul, that that person not be lured away to their previous lifestyle, that they remain true to the Lord and focused on their spiritual transformation. So running away clearly created many problems. And yes, that would be just like what I used to observe when I was at the University of Arizona. Uh, there was an archeology span program where they were working with children with special needs. And every so often I'd see a child go running out the door screaming with an archeologist chasing them, bringing them back so they could teach them the fundamentals for their education. I mean, we do the same thing. If you leave the military without permission, you go AWOL. You could argue that it was a form of AWOL. And just like the military, there are transgressions and there are atrocities attributable to our, our soldiers. But does that make the military an evil enterprise? Well, for some, yes. But this does not implicate all soldiers, all officers, and others who are part of that enterprise. And, and Sarah was part of a system that had been put in place centuries before, and he did follow protocol as per the ecclesiastical dimension. Uh, before you uh, offer some uh, some books uh, about California history and Sarah, because I think some of these questions address that, uh, could, could you comment on um, how the native cultures impacted the friars? How, did, did it change them? Or is there any... Uh, uh, any kind of uh, evidence of that? Yes, in fact, I've raised this issue at uh, missions conferences, and I did this when I was attending a conference in Tubac, Arizona. Everybody was going on and on about how the missionaries impacted the Indians, the missionaries impacted the Indians. And then I said, has anyone really looked at the impact indigenous communities had on the friars? 
because they learned the indigenous languages. They ate indigenous foods. Uh, they basically became a part of a community. Oftentimes it would be one friar and sometimes two if they were lucky, living among 1200 Native Americans, sometimes speaking multiple languages. Uh, and I have seen for myself through the documents and the chronicles, some friars suffered tremendously from the isolation of not being among their own people, so much so that some of them clearly became uh, insane. Uh, I know of several cases where literally they had to be sent back to Mexico City because uh, loneliness, isolation, uh, you know, all of these things inflicted themselves upon them. Uh, and, and then there's the other piece where friars like Fray Felipe Arroyo de la Cuesta literally learned of the kidnapping of two young Indian girls from the Mutsan tribe. And when he learned of this, he mounted a horse with a group of armed Mutsan and they literally tracked down these two young children. And he was at the head of the pack leading the charge as a Franciscan. Uh, to retrieve these young girls from a tribe that was hostile to the Mutsun, because there were conflicts between native communities. And in fact, maybe they're not on the same level today, but there are clearly conflicts between tribal groupings and internally today. That's not to disparage people uh, within these communities, but rather say they too are human beings uh, and they too uh, can transgress even within their own communities. So many friars, I believe, like anthropologists, begin to identify with the people with whom they live, and especially when they live amongst thousands of them. Thank you. Uh, 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 just to wind down here, are, are there any books about Sarah that, uh, and the period of California history that you would recommend? Yeah, I, uh, I like to stick with uh, uh, books, and, and you are now reading one. I'm holding this one up. Uh, this particular book, uh, you may or may not have seen, it's a, it's a hefty volume. And for those of you that have critiques of Sarah, you can find those here. If you have a, a desire to know him on a different level as a fellow human being, there's a lot of very rich content here. This book by uh, Robert Senkowitz and Rosemary Beebe was the result of 10 years of a document translation. So it was a Herculean effort, and it just happened to have come out in time for the canonization. They couldn't have known this was about to happen, but it did. And uh, it's titled Junipero Serra, California Indians and the Transformation of a Missionary by Rosemary Beebe and Robert M. Senkowitz. And again, uh, this book is due to the, the skills of a master Spanish colonial paleographer, Rosemary Beebe, in translating these documents such that we in the English world can read them. Uh, the reality is, is that much of the literature that speaks to Sarah from his own time is in Spanish. And there are many, and I will attest to this, many uh, mission scholars, uh, some of them up and coming. Uh, there are a lot of incentives these days to get into so-called critical mission studies. Uh, and the reality is there are some of those who speak no Spanish or, and it's not so much about speaking Spanish, it's about being able to read documents within the context of the cultural milieu within which they were written. You can't say, oh, I can translate these. Spanish colonial documents are a whole different animal. You need to be able to translate them and understand the nuances of culture and language inherent in those documents. Uh, so that is a definitive resource. I, I, uh, can I just say, I'm, I'm, about, I'm about halfway through with that book and I really appreciate the translation. There, there's full, instead of just excerpts of a letter, it's a whole letter or a whole homily. It's, 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 really, it's really fascinating. So. Is, is there, another, there was another book that you'd recommended, which I had, I think I read years ago, uh, uh, the, 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 something about gold, <laughs> I forget. Yeah, um, I'm trying to think. But that, that was more, there, more there's uh, actually another book here. I, I just uh, published a couple of reviews. Uh, it's, uh, let's see. Well, it's, uh, Steve, it's, uh, it's edited by Steve Hackle. Uh, it was a product of the Huntington Expe uh, exhibition that was conducted in 2013. Uh, and that particular book, I found to be, uh, it, and it wasn't by a, a group of scholars that are seraphi seraphiles. Uh, some of them had very defined uh, views about Sarah, clearly from the outset. Some of them have been known to be Sarah detractors, but when they themselves interrogated the documents and the collections and the materials, each of them wrote up 
a, a different story, but all of them weave together and clearly show that Junipero Serra uh, was an individual who, as a result of being of Catalan origin, was already a renegade to the Spanish Empire. In fact, if you know anything about Barcelona, uh, which is a Catalan-speaking area, they're in rebellion right now. They always have been in rebellion. Uh, they see themselves as a different uh, province, as a different country. And, and Sarah was no different. And so we learned that his, um, that his preferences for art went against the trend of the Spanish colonials. Uh, they were very specific to what indigenous peoples could identify with in the way of art. So virtually every dimension of his life is interrogated. Uh, I can send you, I can send you a, a bit of a bibliography well, that would be that, that would yeah, be wonderful. That way you can circulate uh, to those who are here today. Okay. Uh, but there's there's uh, you know the Engelhart series, yeah. and if you were to interrogate that, this is a, a Franciscan who spent many years translating documents into English. I don't necessarily you know he was an individual of his time. Uh, he was writing in the late 19th, early 20th century, and I don't care for his characterizations of native peoples. Engelhart uh, uh, was basically writing about things that happened in the period, but he would throw in Americanisms. I call them gringoisms, which are essentially derogatory ways of characterizing uh, peoples, not themselves. Ruben, thank you so much uh, for uh, spending time with us. Uh, I wish we had a lot more time to, to, to talk about some of this. Uh, but uh, this, this uh, for all of you, this will be available on YouTube at St. Paul the Apostle Media. That's our YouTube channel for the parish. And, and we'll, we should have that posted uh, by tomorrow. So uh, Ruben, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're so grateful. And uh, it's, it's an important thing to think about in context of everything that's going on. Uh, uh, I, I, there was another question about presentism. There's uh, uh, all these ways of, of thinking about how we go forward, uh, in, especially in today's context with the pandemic and with, uh, with the, the kind of reckoning with our, our racism in the United States. So. Thank you and many blessings. Thank you, Father and Parish. God bless. God bless you.